More than 5 million people worldwide are now believed to have died as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the prosperous West, many countries are looking forward to the coming winter with apprehension. Others, though, have been celebrating the lifting of restrictions imposed on people's personal freedoms. Meanwhile, intensive care units are again bracing for a surge in patients. And in large parts of the global south, things are worse, much worse, with only about 5% of people fully vaccinated. So, on to the point we ask, 5 million COVID-19 deaths and no end in sight? Well, thanks very much for being, us, being with us here on the show. And I'm joined in the studio by Pippa Stevens from DW's science department, who says the pandemic will end, but that end point will not provide the comfort that many are hoping for. Also with us is Jakob Zimank, doctor and science journalist with the weekly paper Die Zeit. And Jakob argues that quite simply this winter, vaccines alone will not suffice. And on the line from Bonn is Hendrik Streeck, a prominent virologist at the University of Bonn, who believes the pandemic is far from over and we are all part of it, vaccinated or not. Well, thank you all three for being with us today and thank you for those introductory statements. We'll go straight to Bonn and uh, Professor Streeck uh, and this figure of five million lives that have now been lost to COVID-19. Uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said it's a painful new threshold. Is it something that you as a seasoned scientist can take in your stride? Well, I think um, um, Tedros from the WHO already put it the right way that it is something we could have done better. And one of the most critical point and best tools actually we have is the vaccination worldwide. So we need to put more emphasis on vaccinating in um, other parts of the world where we have only countries with 2% vaccination rate. And on the other hand, like people don't want, want to get vaccinated. So we need to give more explanation what a vaccine can do and cannot. So I think we are very much focused on our home countries, which is on the one hand side, uh, critically important for us. But on the other hand, we can only end the pandemic if we are really vaccinating everywhere in the world. Mm. And you have been quoted as saying that our grasp of the dynamic behind the infection is not that great. That surprised me, that comment. For me, in layman's terms, that seemed to suggest that in, that in the last two years, we haven't learnt an awful lot. Well, what I'm referring to is particularly of what happens in Germany, but also in other parts of the world, that we don't really understand the incidences. So how many people are uh, every day being infected? What we are normally are doing is to um, just r report the cases that have been diagnosed. But some countries in the world, like Qatar or uh, England, are actually doing representative sentinel um, 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 uh, studies to understand how many people are being infected if they are vaccinated, if they're not vaccinated, one from what social group they are from. So to better understand where we have bigger outbreaks and what kind of transmissions we have. I think we can learn more and I think we can be much better in this. And are we going to have to accept that this, that this challenge to our well-being is now here to stay? Well, this, this is one uh, important point to realize that this virus is, of course, becoming endemic. So every winter, uh, we will have larger waves, at least in the northern hemisphere, uh, of uh, transmissions and infections of um, COVID-19. But every year, we are becoming more experienced with that. And we will also, with vaccination and people who are um, uh, recovered from COVID-19, will not be affected that much anymore. Mm. So what I'm expecting that we have a pretty uh, harsh uh, winter again, um, uh, fall and winter, where we have higher rates of uh, infections. But then with the spring and summertime, we will we will getting more into the time of an endemic. And that probably will happen worldwide. OK, Pippa Stevens, uh, tell me a little bit about the fears that people have in Germany about the winter that lies ahead, the harsh winter that lies ahead. Do you share the concerns that many people are expressing? 
Well, I think we've got a block of unvaccinated people and it's difficult to see how that could um, kind of be tackled. And I think the infection numbers are very concerning and I think the hospitalizations as well um, are also concerning. And I can un understand why many people feel fear. I mean, the German health ministry was saying that triage, you know, wouldn't be needed. But even the fact that triage is being mentioned, um, I think is, is cause for concern. And it surprised me as well to, to hear that word, that doom laden word once again. Yeah. yeah. And at the same time, we have Merkel saying that um, there won't be another a lockdown for vaccinated people. And I, I find that a bit of a discord, actually. Mm. So, uh, Jakob, Jakob Zimank, uh, there's a lot of talk of uh, staying on the same, uh, the same point about the winter. There's a talk of uh, a calm before the storm. Mm -hmm. You know, that sounds very, very ominous. Yeah, I think there are two things coming together right now. People have been in this pandemic for quite a long time and they really tried not to get infected and they were really, really kind of going with the restrictions and at some point they get this sort of pandemic fatigue and this is happening on the one on the one side and then we're seeing we have these immunity gaps still so there's a block of people that are not vaccinated there are people that might have been vaccinated or infected but are still very vulnerable to the infection like old people and people with immunosuppressant drugs any sorts of things chronic diseases etc and this is sort of coming together we still have a lot of vulnerable people and uh, people are sort of fatigued Mm. It's interesting that uh, the, the, the crisis has been compared or been described as the most serious crisis or one of the most serious crises since the end of the Second World War. Is it relevant to ask who's, you know, what are we getting wrong or is that the wrong question? I think there's two things to say to that. The first thing is that it is a relevant crisis and it would have been a relevant crisis anyway, no matter how we acted. I think that there was no perfect reaction that would have prevented everything, uh, especially in the beginning when not much was known about the virus and we introduced a sort of lockdown in Germany. On the other hand, I guess we've had two years, of, we have two years of experience now with the virus and, and treating and, and kind of fighting the virus. And I think not enough lessons have been learned in terms of how to prevent infections, in terms of reaching people with a vaccination campaign, etc. So um, that's fair to say, I guess. Mm -hmm. Should we have been more vigilant? Um, in the first place? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had pandemics before. We've had Ebola, we've had SARS-CoV-1. And afterwards, the world has said, you know, we, we have to learn from this. We can't let this happen again. Um, and, and, and it has. And um, yeah, I, I I, and, I, and I'm concerned as well that, that even at this stage in the pandemic, I feel like governments just aren't acting fast enough. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's interesting because, I mean, the, the pandemics you mentioned were pandemics that were kind of easily suppressible, more, more easily suppressible than SARS-CoV-2 is, basically. And if you look at the German reaction at the very beginning of the, of the epidemic in early 2020, suppression went OK when we had this outbreak in the car part factory, basically. But once it spread, was well, widespread, I, I, I think we noticed that there was not enough expertise on, on this pandemic that's kind of really not an outbreak that you can easily suppress. OK, before we continue, let's have a look at uh, the latest from two European countries. First, Denmark, where most people agree that things are getting back to normal. Germany, meanwhile, uh, risks running out of momentum in its effort to tackle the pandemic. Denmark, mid-September. 50,000 people gather for a concert in Copenhagen. The mood is exhilarating. Masks and social distancing are a thing of the past. Wow, so many people. It's incredible. The Danes love their freedom, and they understand that with vaccination, you can get that freedom back. 83% of Danes above the age of 12 are fully vaccinated. Life has mostly returned to normal, though currently infection rates are rising sharply again, with a seven-day incidence of 207. In Germany, the health minister plans to end corona restrictions in November, maintaining that life will be back to normal by spring. The party is likely to form the new government coalition agree. Meanwhile, a fourth wave is building up. Infection numbers are rising, vaccinations are stagnating at 64% and intensive care units are filling up with the unvaccinated and cases of vaccine breakthrough. How risky is a return to normal?
people of Denmark, Jakob, clearly believe that uh, they have more or less returned to normal. Uh, is that complacency, or is the, do, do you do you uh, do you understand that position? I think Denmark is in a different position because they have higher vaccination rates and they have a very have done a very good job vaccinating the high risk groups. That means especially old people. They have vaccination rates of well be beyond like 95 percent in the older population parts, and that gives them kind of it puts them in a better position than than Germany is right now. I think that's that's fair to say at first. And then Denmark was very transparent from the beginning on about the strategy, and I think that kind of build a lot of trust with the, with the people and the whole strategy of, of really getting people vaccinated, getting them, them, them on board worked quite well. Um, and I'm not sure, I mean, looking at the winter, I guess nobody really knows where, how things will develop, but I guess if you do communication very openly, very transparently, and you say we might turn around at some point if it gets too dire, um, then that's fair. And But it's just something you have to be transparent about. And I guess nobody really knows how the wind is going to be in Denmark. Communication is so very important. Of course, yeah. yeah. Hendrik Strick in, in, in Bonn, when you see those images from Denmark and when you, know, and you compare them to other places uh, in the world around Europe, uh, it's a very broad uh, panorama that we have. We have some nations that seem to be doing well, others where t uh, conditions are awful. How do you explain that, that disparity between uh, different countries? Well, first of all, I fully agree with what, what was just said by Jacob, um, but um, I, I think it's an important debate to have um, when um, the measures basically end. And it is, I, I find it a wrong debate to have in the winter time when we just know we will have high rates of uh, uh, infections. But at the same time, I think we are currently in the transition period from pandemic to endemic. And um, we will have to define an end to certain measures, hygiene concepts, etc. That being said, I think it's a wrong a discussion to have in the winter time because we just know we will have high numbers of infections and what we can see in Great Britain or in Denmark, they also, despite the high rates of vaccination, they also have rising um, numbers of infections. So discussing this now maybe for the spring, springtime where we know we will have a reduction in uh, numbers of infection at, ye at least in the northern hemisphere, I think it's a, it's a good start. Mm. And just going back to some of the figures we heard, we heard in that report that 65%, just over 65% of the population in Germany are fully vaccinated. That figure compares with 83% for the Danes, 80% uh, in Spain, 71 in Italy and so on. Why is jab refusal so high in Germany? Well, first of all, um, the skepticism against vaccination in Germany is like uh, also historically uh, a little bit higher compared to other countries. Um, then for other parts, you can uh, only speculate. There had been one study from Denmark that shows that there is just more trust in the government in Denmark um, associated to um, uh, higher vaccination rate. And in Germany, apparently, we do not have this really high number of trust in the government in the measures uh, against the COVID-19 pandemic. And the third point, um, Italy and Spain, who have really high rates of vaccination, they had a lot of deaths. So they had suffered, really suffered through the COVID-19 pandemic. And that might also bring people more uh, uh, to actually get vaccinated. Okay. But again, that's all at the end uh, uh, speculation. Yeah. And is it time to start talking about mandatory vaccination? You nod. Yeah, well, I think it's a really, I think it's a really interesting question, actually. Um, I, I know of a study in Sweden where people who were kind of um, not completely anti-vaccination but thought it was a bit of a faff, they were offered monetary incentives and it worked, it worked really well. Um, but in terms of kind of accessing that, that block of people who just really, really don't want to get vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, in countries like Germany, I, I you know, I, I can't see many other options, but I think it's very country specific. Like if you look at countries in sub-Saharan Africa, um, I think it could actually have the, uh, the opposite effect. It could be counterintuitive, you know. Um, if, if people are concerned about malaria, about tuberculosis, about poverty, no one's doing anything, and, they just, and then the government comes in and says, you have to have this vaccination, mm -hmm. you know. I, and, and I think any loss of trust in, in, in those countries would, could be very damaging. Hendrik, mandatory vaccination, is it not uh, a very divisive strategy? It is a very divisive strategy. I think... Oh, it was for Hendrik? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, um, 
but, but, and I guess before doing that, we need to really get the people who are kind of still kind of uh, convincible in a way. And I guess uh, we, we had the example of Spain, for example, and Spain and England, what they did is they really addressed people personally, saying you can get vaccinated now, for example. So they sent letters. They even sent letters with appointments for vaccination appointment, basically. And people had to kind of cancel that. So it was kind of an opt out option there. And the same in Germany, I guess, um, there are a lot of people you could still reach by by kind of a well-designed campaign. And I look, that means also speaking about parts of the population that don't speak German. So we have a lot of a lot of basically surveys looking into vaccine skepticism and none of them is really done in other languages than German. So we don't know anything about non-German speaking people in, in Germany. So and we also know from other from other surveys that there, there's a correlation between basically migratory background, like migration background mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. vaccine acceptance and acceptiveness uh, and accept, acceptance, sorry. And we also know that about trust towards kind of the state and we know that people who have low trust in basically the state don't get vaccinated that regularly and so we have to think about who's the person who approaches people basically uh, in order to convince them to get vaccinated and that should not be the state in many in many cases but kind of people from their communities from their major religious groups etc so i think we need really need to tailor the vaccination campaign before we go in with a kind of compulsory vaccination for the yeah. mandate and make it easy for people as well like it's it's hard it's really hard like to to know where you should get vac vaccinated should it be a workplace should it be a vaccination center mm -hmm. in the first place and that could be a, that could be a hurdle too and um yeah i think just making it easy for people and mm -hmm. saying yeah this is this is your appointment very important point so let's change change track just a little bit uh, because while many in the west struggle to come to terms with covid they do so uh, and i use the term advisedly in comparative luxury in the global south after all it's often a straightforward matter of life and death and that assessment certainly applies uh, to many countries across africa corona vaccination is the exception not the rule in many african countries in some regions, rates are as low as 1 to 2 percent due to a lack of available doses. As a result, the virus is spreading and people are dying en masse. In cemeteries like this one in Zimbabwe, it's one funeral after the other. In South Africa, the picture is different. There are more than enough doses, yet only 25 percent of the population has been vaccinated. This is mostly due to the long distances to the vaccination centers, as well as to superstition. Many here believe that praying protects against COVID and that Western medicine causes infertility. Aid organizations are sending vaccination teams to the locations where people collect their welfare benefits. Still, over 40% of South Africans refuse to get vaccinated. Is Africa falling behind in the fight against coronavirus? Hendrik Steg, uh, the question I suppose is not is Africa falling behind, but is, is Africa being allowed to fall behind by the more prosperous North and West? Well, um, we cannot allow that because um, we, we know that uh, we can only end the pandemic if we are vaccinating worldwide. In particular, also having a view on potential uh, uh, mutations that can develop, variants that can be developed from um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 that we cannot predict. And so how higher the viral load is worldwide and so how more people are actually infected with this virus as more likely it is that we are having um, uh, mutations or escape mutations that will happen where vaccines do not work that well anymore. So it would harm us at the end if we are not really vaccinating everywhere in the world. Pippa, what do you say about that, about the, uh, the, the, this very important point of vaccine justice and, the, and, the, and everybody in the world having access to vaccination? Yeah, I mean, I think the booster kind of campaign has been the... The, the latest in what has been a very unequal rollout and distribution. And I mean, but that goes back sort of before the pandemic. And um, the one one glimmer of hope I did have is that uh, BioNTech have, have announced they're setting up a manufacturing plant um, in, in Africa to try and, um, yeah, boost manufacturing capabilities. Um, but it's, I mean, the optics are the optics are terrible you know we had freedom day in july in the uk and kind of parties like in denmark and um, but then you have frontline workers who can't be who can't be vaccinated it's yeah 
Jakob, what do you think? Is the West, is, is, is Europe, is the, is the rich North and the rich West doing enough to help, uh, to help Africa? In concrete terms, I mean, we talk about it, but we wring our hands. Mm. We talk about it a lot, and a lot of people say there need to be global solidarity, and then we've seen the West basically buying up all the stocks of vaccines in the last year. Mm. But I think we're about, that might be about to change. I mean, we're looking at production capacity escalating. We're looking at, like, uh, smaller demand in the global north of, of vaccines. So I guess there will be a lot of vaccines available, especially produced in India in the, in the upcoming month. And then it's a question also of logistics, reaching the people. And it, skepticism is a, is a topic. And I think in, in, the, in the little film it was mentioned that the, the fear of, of uh, infertility after vaccination, that's not new. We know about that. There have been like vaccination campaigns with other vaccines in Nigeria, for example, where the topic came up. And we also know how to tackle that. There is kind of anthropological work on that. And I think we really need to do that. We really need to get on the ground. We need to get the logistics right for, for basically the upcoming months when a lot of vaccines will be available. So uh, let's look into the future, basically. Looking to the future, Hendrik Strake, how, how realistic does that, uh, does that uh, appear to you? We, uh, we need to get vaccines into the arms of 40% of people in all countries by the end of this year, says the World, World Health Organization. It, it doesn't sound likely that they're going to achieve that in that time. No, I agree. It doesn't sound likely. And um, one, one important point is that many um, uh, individuals in, in the South uh, are really skeptic, skeptic uh, to get vaccinated. This is partially due because some pop stars have said they can, um, a vaccination can make you uh, infertile, so you can't have any babies anymore. So um, I, I think one really important uh, point against, uh, besides actually getting the vaccine there, is to have uh, campaigns to um, inform individuals about the benefit of vaccination and take the fear of uh, potentially becoming infertile. And uh, Pippa Stevens, just one, one question about Germany, which is, I think is quite important. Everybody knows that Germany has got a, a, an old government going out and a new government coming in. How much is that affecting the debate about how to tackle the COVID crisis in Germany? I mean, I, I think it's, it's sort of it's stalling it and um, it's difficult to take decisive action if you're in flux. Um, but then, I mean, I, you know, I come from the UK and it's also the federal system is also can, can also be difficult to get decisions through fast. And we've, we've seen that since the pandemic started. So for me, it's kind of it is. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously affecting how quickly we get, um, Germany can act, but it's it's also yeah, in, in my mind, having one government, it's kind of, it's also slow, generally, I think. Mm -hmm. Jakob Zimak, we, uh, we talked about the, uh, the, the, the wealthy countries struggling to help uh, poorer countries. Uh, what impact do you think the German government and the developments there are having on that? In terms of the poorer countries? Yeah. I mean, Germany has been very outspoken for, like, a global equitable access to vaccines, but um, they did not... I mean, they, but they also, on the other hand, bought a lot of vaccines via the EU for their own citizens first. Um, but I guess Germany will continue and also the new government to push basically for equitable access. They have very close ties between uh, the old government and, and the WHO, for example. And um, so Germany has always been very outspoken about that for multilateral um, global health system that needs to be strengthened. And that also includes equitable access to vaccines. Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees that we were very poorly prepared for the for the pandemic two years ago. Are we just as poorly prepared now? No, but we're not so well prepared for the winter, I guess. I mean, we're having rapid tests on the hand that, that, that should be used frequently in uh, all sorts of contexts, also for, like, vaccinated people who have still have the risk of, risk of transmitting and getting the virus and transmitting it. Um, we have vaccines. We have uh, the first therapeutics com coming onto the market. So I think we're way better prepared, but we're not as, as prepared as we could have been. Hendrik Strait, do you agree with that assessment? Are we better prepared now? Well, I understood the question a little bit differently. Um, I thought the question would um, gear towards whether we are better prepared for a future pandemic oh. uh, that might happen with a different virus. And I think if you... Well, it can go both ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and if you're if you taking only this aspect, I agree that we are better prepared than two years ago for, for the ongoing pandemic. But for a future pandemic, we have not really 
um, made big changes, in particular in giving WHO more rights to actually get go into countries and uh, assess potential outbreaks. With all criticism that you might have at the WHO, it is actually that is something that we need to foster um, and to rebuild and reshape in a way that we have a better like uh, emergency response team that can, uh, yeah, assess uh, future pandemics and actually contain them at the beginning. Pippa Stevens, the question we had at the top of the show, is there no end in sight? Well, I think there will, I think the, the pandemic, the global pandemic will end. But my hope is, is that um, we grow to accept some measures like hand washing and mask wearing on public transport. And that will help in, you know, the week, the yearly flu crisis, but also in future pandemics, which science, scientists say will be sooner than we might think or hope. OK, thank you very much for those closing remarks. We've been talking about the threat of COVID, the ongoing threat. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye-bye and tschüss.